Hello and welcome to the official podcast of Palate Exposure, featuring Alona Thompson, a podcast for those seeking the ultimate in wine, food, and travel. Each week, she interviews winemakers, chefs, celebrities, and a variety of guests that shape the way we enjoy life. I not only didn't know that these headaches were migraines, but I also didn't know that they were triggered by certain things. They can be triggered in some people by dark chocolate. Well, I love dark chocolate and it never did trigger a migraine on me. It just didn't do it. But I never knew what it was that would trigger a migraine. One of the things they did when we crossed the equator, they had a, um, I just call him a fat ass sailor uh, who was, uh, uh, they painted his uh, stomach belly that stuck out uh, this far and uh, he painted it with uh, uh, fuel oil, Navy fuel oil, the kind that's burned in the uh, in the uh, engines of um, uh, the, the steamship uh, engines, and um, uh, it's it's the grossest smelling thing you could imagine. Well, that turned out to be a trigger for me, and uh, part of the deal is uh, this guy, this fat ass sailor that was sitting there with his. Uh, uh, baby's uh, cap on and uh, dressed like a little baby with uh, diapers on and you had to kiss the royal baby. He was the royal baby and uh, of course his stomach was all full of, of fuel oil and uh, when you would get up to kiss his stomach somebody behind you would slam your face into it and you got diesel oil all over your face and um, I got so sick that day uh, I had a, a three-day migraine uh, there was no way I was going to go to sick bay and tell them I'm sick because I was scared to death that they'd uh, take me out of the program. You know, if this guy is not suit, suit fitted for uh, military duty. He is. Uh, he gets these severe headaches. We don't know what they are, and he doesn't know what they are. But we don't want him in the military. I wasn't going to let them do that to me. So I just. Uh, uh, kind of toughed it out over the three-day period and I told uh, my buddies, you know, what I've got, the problem here is I, I'm real sick and I get this uh, all the time. And They would help me clean up the uh, place where I'd throw up and, and so on and and uh, a couple of them got sick but uh, from different uh, different things. And uh, that's what uh, Alona is referring to uh, in the, the, what we went through just to get into the Marine Corps let alone uh, after, we're, uh, after we're in it. You know, um, I had a very powerful visceral reaction when I was reading that passage in the book, I happen to be a migraine sufferer. Oh. That's yeah. something we have in common besides yes. the wallpaper. And like you, I love dark chocolate, but it's not one of my triggers. But I understand the one side of the head, the pain is so excruciating that you feel that you're losing your mind. And those of you that are listening, Hopefully none of you are migraine sufferers, but if you are, you understand. It's an inhuman kind of pain. And to have to be in such a hostile environment, forget medical care. I mean, these days we have, obviously, some effective drugs at the time. I'm sure there was nothing even under the best of circumstances, but to be thrust into such an adversarial situation where, you know, you were lucky to get any kind of support and help from your peers, um, you know, the level of empathy that I feel and what it shows me, you know, about you as a human being, as, as a person that survived, again, in some ways the unsurvivable, um, that to me just says a lot about who you are. And I think it's part of, uh, part of growing up poor and you had to do everything yourself. I think that's yeah. what got me through that. I don't think I was any tougher than anybody else, but uh, we were all pretty tough. And you just had to, to, to grow up that way. Yeah. Um, you know, I did not know, uh, you and I might be uh, distant relatives, I have no idea, because uh, the Vikings uh, uh, certainly went to, to St. Petersburg. They were uh, all the way in Eastern Europe, uh, following all the rivers and so on. My, uh, I don't know what my grandfather's name was in Sweden. He never told anyone. He was terrified of the uh, Swedish king when he uh, apparently sneaked out of Sweden and uh, got on a ship and uh, went to America and he met um, a German lady on the on the ship and um, 
they uh, they hit it off very well apparently, and uh, they got married uh, in America when they uh, landed. And he assumed the name Peterson because it's a common name wow. uh, in America. And uh, he did not speak Swedish to my father or to my father's siblings, so they uh, they don't know. And I don't know where he was in Sweden. I don't know what his name was. Now with DNA, I suppose I can find that. Yeah. But uh, but back then uh, there was no way of knowing, and my dad um, my dad never learned how to speak Swedish because uh, his father uh, I'm an American you know and that's the way it is he said and uh, with this severe Swedish accent he'd say I'm an American. That is that is so awesome, you know the backstory like the history that you've lived and listening to you tell stories from personal experience not from movies or books. I so believe that they should be heard loud and clear because in a lot of ways we live in such an artificial world. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? It really is. And this is the real world and this is how it was. And not only you survived it, but you were thriving in it. You mm -hmm. built a successful life and career despite the fact that everything that could be thrown at you, I mean, what could be worse than a war? Risking well, your that's life. true. Yes, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're such a strong person. Whether you fully realize it, like you're saying that, you know, this is just what had to be done. There's such a powerful message there, that you know, when you're faced with, you have one choice to survive or to not. What it brings out in you and and how it mobilizes. Mm -hmm. Everything that you know and who you are. Well, you know, when you, um, I was the first one in my family, and my extended family even, I was the first one to ever even go to college. And um, uh, I felt an obligation. Uh, I, I uh, yeah, I, I showed up uh, when, I, when it came time to go to the Marine Corps and go uh, where the war was on. I, I showed up. I didn't uh, have to, uh, I didn't have to get shot at as it turned out, but I was ready. And, um, uh, that was an obligation. Uh, my gosh, these guys gave me, uh, at the time, they, gave, they had given me four years of college, and boy, that was something. I was really, uh, really pleased with that, so of course I'd show up. And then when I, when I got out uh, to be uh, in a lucky position of having yet another four years if I wanted it, uh, that was unbelievable. So uh, a lot of people today, um, uh, the do-gooders, I call them. I, I don't like them, really. I d never met any of them, I guess, but I don't like them uh, because they're, uh, they want uh, things that I don't want. They want to get rid of the ROTC programs in colleges. Uh, shouldn't have military in college. Well, why not? Uh, they think you, uh, you, you shouldn't do that. And uh, I see red when, I, when that happens because the ROTC was such a great program for me personally and for a lot of my friends. We got a chance to be college, become college graduates. Uh, we couldn't have done it otherwise. Uh, trying to uh, work on farms all summer uh, for two or three years in high school, uh, I saved up enough money that I could afford one year at Iowa State College, one year. Well, how am I going to get four years? I couldn't have done it without the, if I hadn't, uh, searched out and found uh, possible scholarships and uh, even and I had to pass tests to get them and so on and I did that. Um, I think the Navy ROTC was uh, two percent of the uh, people who took the exam uh, were chosen. It was that, uh, that uh, tight uh, program but we wanted it uh, badly enough that out of I think there were seven of us in high school who uh, took that test and I think uh, four made it. And that was pretty good, four, four out of seven when, it's, when you had to be on the top two percent of the, of, the, of the people who took the exam. Um, I think that uh, part of it shows, it doesn't show how smart we are, were at all, it shows how, uh, how uh, um, uh, organized we were, how, how, uh, how badly we wanted it. And so you, you work hard when you, need, when you see a goal there and, do, and get it. And there's so many conversations, <clears throat> cultural, um, kind of social fabric driven conversations about current generations 
and um, I feel that it's been quite ossified. And unfortunately, um, because the older generations had it so tough, and they chose to protect their children to their detriment in some ways because, you know, they have no way, no wherewithal to learn life skills. When you're rewarded for just showing up, it breeds that sense of entitlement. Mm -hmm. And what you're describing is the opposite of that. Yes. You know, um, I, I compare my life to my father's life. Um, uh, when his father came from Sweden to this country, um, he wasn't educated at all. Um, most people coming into the country weren't in those days. He arrived here in, um, I don't know, 19, uh, 1890 or so, 91 or two, something like that. And um, my father was born uh, on December 7th, 1900. And um, that was a particularly lucky time. I mean, of course, we always knew how old he was. It was the year we were in, or, or this December of that year it would have been. On December 7th, uh, 1941, my dad was particularly lucky because he became 41 years old and the draft in America went up to age 40. If you were 41, he didn't have to sign up for the draft. By one day, he missed that. Wow. Uh, he did the same thing in World War I. On uh, December 7th, 1918, he would have been 18 years old, and therefore he would have gone into the army. He would have been forced to. But the armistice in 1918 happened in November, less than a month before his birthday. So my dad was particularly lucky there. Okay, he was unlucky in another respect, though. Uh, makes up for it, maybe. Uh, uh, his father uh, believed uh, that kids have to earn their own living as soon as they can. And so um, he allowed his children to go through eighth grade in school. But at eighth grade, once you graduate from eighth grade, by gosh, you're going to go and earn your living. So my dad uh, had to get a job in the coal mine in Iowa. There were a lot of coal mines in Iowa then, soft coal. Coal seams were as little as 30 feet below the surface and sometimes right at the surface. So they dig a, they dig a, um, a, a hole in the ground straight down uh, to put an elevator down and the coal seam was maybe only three feet thick and so he would take the elevator down and they'd start drilling holes in the coal seam working on their hands and knees all day long. And uh, so I compare my life to what uh, how my dad did it, oh, my gosh, uh, he he uh, taken out of school at the end of eighth grade and then having to work the rest of his life for very low wages. So I felt pretty darn lucky. Wow. I think what it instilled mm -hmm. in you is a whole other level of integrity and work ethic and humility and a sense of honor. Well, you know, that early life, uh, the reason I put it in the book, I, I mean, I, I realize that a lot of people start out thinking this is an autobiography. Yeah. Uh, it's written like an autobiography, but that's not at all what it is. As you know, you've read it. Um, it's not an autobiography. It, the, the, the early stages simply explains why I did many of the things I did in the wine industry later on in the later part of the book. The book actually, uh, The Winemaker, is... Um, I call it a history of the wine industry between prohibition and the present. It's how the wine industry went from prohibition, which totally destroyed the wine industry uh, and destroyed all love for fine wines. It, nobody cared what the wine tasted like uh, during prohibition. Uh, I mean, these guys could all say they made the best wine in the world, but nobody believed that, I think. Only the one who made it believed it. But all the others knew that what they were really after is the alcohol. And that was, this, that was the statement. It was beverage, alcohol, baby, and that's it. You know, you went for the alcohol. So it didn't matter that all the wines produced during Prohibition, and I think all of them is true, all of the wines produced during Prohibition were produced from table grapes, not from wine grapes at all. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, uh, the main reason was that when, the, uh, when Prohibition started, um, uh, and all of a sudden everybody showed up as home winemakers. They had to buy grapes from somewhere and uh, there were a lot more grapes in California than anywhere else. 
So uh, they started buying grapes. Well, the grapes never made it past Reno. I think they would spoil before they ever got to okay. Chicago or New York. Yeah. And uh, so the um, the uh, grape growers in California realized very quickly that the quality was too good. The, the wine grapes don't work. You can't ship wine grapes like that. You got to put table grapes that are designed to sit around for weeks uh, without spoiling on the tabletop. And uh, so they. Uh, pulled out whatever wine grapes there were, and there weren't many good wine grapes in California, but what there were were all pulled out. They were replaced with table grapes, and table grapes were used for the um, Eastern, um, to produce wine in the East. Uh, one thing I, I say in there, there was a, uh, you could buy, even, even table grapes didn't last forever. And so to make them keep, the, uh, the growers out here were pretty, pretty clever, I thought, to, they, uh, they figured out that most of the, virtually all, of the flavor and color and, uh, and goodness in, uh, in a grape, whether it's table grape or, or a wine grape, virtually all of it is in the skin. Nothing is really in the juice. The, the juice of grapes, even wine grapes, it tends to be simply a little bit of acidity, a whole lot of sugar, and a bunch of water. That's really all that's in a grape. A little bit of tannin that doesn't count, but most of the tan is in, is in the skins, most of the flavor is in the skins, anything that's going to become body for the wine is in the skins, the color, uh, it's all in the skins. So the skins are what's important. Well, the growers back in the 1920, when the Prohibition started, or 21, um, they had these table grapes. They would crush the grapes uh, at one of the local wineries that were now closed up, but they crushed the grapes. They let the juice fall out onto the ground. They would press the skins, uh, and, and they called them grape bricks, um, B-R-I-C-K-S, grape bricks. They were pressed so that it was almost dry, and the grape bricks were probably, uh, oh, I don't know, 10 inches long, maybe uh, four or five inches square, and then mm -hmm. 10 inches long, something like that. And uh, I found a, a, a wrapper on one of the, uh, one of the grape bricks that my dad would buy. The, the whole point is, when you make a grape brick, uh, grape grape skins into bricks, they're pretty much dry, and uh, they don't really spoil. You can ship them. Uh, you're not shipping a lot of weight now, so it's easy to do. So they could ship uh, many, many tons of grape bricks east, and uh, the people would uh, would just follow the um, follow the caution. It was not an instruction. Uh, it it didn't have an instruction on it. It had a caution. And the caution was, do not break up uh, uh, five grape bricks with five pounds of sugar, add five gallons of water, and the yeast packet, which is enclosed, <laughs> because this might ferment. And that was the uh, caution uh, not to do. <laughs> so that was uh, how everybody made their wine during Prohibition. And no wonder uh, uh, I started in the book by explaining that uh, uh, if you took a snapshot at the beginning of Prohibition, or at the end of Prohibition, and 25 years later, uh, uh, if you took snapshots, they'd be identical. They would show uh, dreary, uh, 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 moth-eaten wineries uh, producing uh, dreary wines from, I forgot how I said it, but it's in the book, uh, uh, trying to sell it to an uninterested public, because that's what it was. And the public, uh, uh, after Prohibition, didn't care just as they didn't care before prohibition they didn't they weren't interested in quality they just wanted alcohol because they thought that's what you did when um, it surprised me a little bit in reading background that um, there was a pretty good wine uh, industry in California up until prohibition mm -hmm. from about 1890 uh, through 1900 up to about 1920 there was there were some very nice wines produced and uh, medal-winning wines uh, in, in uh, European uh, like the Paris Fair, yeah. yeah, there were some. There weren't a lot, but there were some. And so uh, uh, there was there was appreciation for fine wine then. Mm. But by by the end of Prohibition, there was no appreciation at all. So that when uh, nobody pulled out the table grapes now and uh, and replaced them with wine grapes. Uh, you don't pull out grapes until they're, uh, grape, grape vines until they're 40 or 50 or 60 years old. 
only then the vines uh, have lost their oomph, so, so to speak, and uh, and they don't produce such good wine anymore. And so that's when you replace them. Well, uh, these grapes were planted in 1920, in the early 1920s. So uh, when prohibition happened in the 30s, mid 30s, 1934, um, those grapevines were only 15 years old and farmers weren't gonna pull the grapes out of the ground. So they just left in the table grapes and that meant that all the new wineries that started up in 1934 when prohibition was repealed, all the new wineries had to use table grapes and they did to make their wine. Well, they did that for 25 more years up until about 1960. When I got my PhD in 1958, um, I went into an industry that the wines were still just as dreary as they had been during Prohibition, I'm sure, and uh, just as stupid. They didn't have color, flavor, body. They didn't have anything that, the, that people now want in a wine. Uh, they were just, it was just alcohol. And Giulio Gallo, I give him great credit. Um, uh, when Giulio and Ernest started the Gallo Winery in 1933, you were allowed to start the winery as long as you couldn't sell it until the prohibition was uh, was uh, uh, approved by all the, by enough states that uh, that it became a uh, 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 law. And um, but he started thinking when when I, I remember when I went there in 1958, the first thing he told me when he hired me was that um, they were thinking of, uh, of putting in some uh, some better grapes into the ground. And I didn't really understand what he was talking about because I didn't really know grapes very well. I'd, I'd made wine as a, in research at college in graduate school, but, um, and I recognized that there were different, some varieties were better than others, but I didn't really realize at the time that everything was made out of table grapes. There were three, uh, the, the three primary uh, wines, wineries in the country uh, by size. Number one was Roma, Number two was Italian Swiss Colony, and number three was Gallo in size. Well, Roma had a severe disadvantage. They were owned by a liquor company, and liquor companies have an unblemished record of failing every time when they try to make decent wine. And the reason is they don't understand it. They think that wine is just beverage alcohol, and uh, they treat it the way they treated booze. Uh, vodka, uh, spirit, uh, any kind of spirits is merely alcohol, and people who drink spirits drink it for the alcohol, not for anything else. Uh, nobody can tell me that uh, that there's really good flavor in scotch. It, it's uh, it's a terrible flavor, and even bourbon has a terrible flavor. It's very hot, alcoholic. It tastes like wood a little bit, but you can't taste the corn that went into bourbon. You can't taste the uh, the barley that went into these things, uh, the malt, uh, you, you taste none of that, you just get the alcohol. But wine is totally different, and people didn't know that. Well, Giulio was telling me this, that he wanted to start putting in some decent grapes in the ground. And uh, I went to the trouble of, uh, of finding uh, a brochure that Gallo had, uh, the, the, the brochure that Gallo was using to sell wine in 1958 when I went to work there. Uh, it has it, it's got a picture and it shows all the um, the wines that they make and that's in one of the early pages uh, on the uh, the color picture and the white wine what you would call today white table wine uh, guess what the name was Sautern it didn't say anything it was Sautern there's no no uh, uh, no other name was used Roma their best white wine that was Sautern Italian Swiss Colony best white wine that was Sautern Gallo had two or three sauternes like they did. Sweet, very sweet, and unbelievably sweet. They, they all were called dry, but they weren't uh, dry. They were ghastly. They, they were really bad uh, sweet. And they didn't have any flavor at all. They didn't taste good. They just tasted like sweet alcohol. And um, it's because, and I thought, I, I remember saying to somebody, I don't think I told Julio this, but I did tell uh, some of the other the winemakers, when I met the people who were making wine for Gallo, and uh, I, they wanted to know if I had these wines before, and I said, yeah, I've tasted Roma before, tasted Italian Swiss, tasted Gallo, they all taste alike. And they'd start to laugh and say, that's because we make them all by Thompson seedless grapes. We're not, we don't use wine grapes, you know, we use, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a carryover from a Prohibition. 
Well, Julio just quietly started pulling out Thompson seedless grapes and putting in French Columbard, Chenin Blanc, uh, um, Alagote, I mean, grapes that uh, uh, today maybe aren't considered the top varietals, but back then compared to Thompson seedless, they were like gold. They were so much better. The wine was so much better. And Gallo very quickly um, passed up Italian Swiss colony. And by this time, Roma had already died because their, uh, their ownership, uh, uh, they were owned by Shinley. And Shinley is particularly, uh, in, in, in the words that I used in those days, Shinley was particularly stupid when it came to uh, making an understanding wine and their, their company went from number one in the country to zilch. It, it just failed, totally. That made uh, Italian Swiss Colony uh, elevated up to number one. Gallo became number two, but Italian Swiss Colony had a disadvantage. They were owned by a bunch of growers and they were Thompson Seedless growers. Well, they're not about to pull out their Thompson Seedless, you know, they, you make the wine. So the poor, um, I felt sorry for my competitors at Italian Swiss Colony. They had to use Thompson Seedless and we got to use French Colombard and Chenin Blanc and Alagote and we didn't have Chardonnay, no, but we sure had better grapes than the Thompson Seedless. So Gallo very quickly took over as number one. I went there in 1958 and I think by, by 1961 they were already number one, uh, higher than, uh, uh, and growing fast. By 1968 when I left Gallo to move to Napa Valley, um, Gallo was twice the size of Italian Swiss Colony, so that's how fast it went. The, 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 uh, the appearance of fine wine grapes uh, took over and uh, suddenly wine became worth, you know, worth drinking then, worth enjoying with food and so on. And that's covered in the book. It explains just how that happened. Um, and uh, the public, of course, latched onto it very quickly and everybody, uh, uh, it, was a, it was an explosion, jump into good grapes. Italian Swiss, I think, was one of the last of the companies to go into good grapes. And, and as a company, they sort of died out and eventually were, uh, were sold. Um, they were sold, let me see, I, I, uh, I went to, I was in Gallo from 1958 to 1968. I think Italian Swiss Colony was already sold by about 1967. While I was still at Gallo, it was sold. It was sold to, uh, guess what, a, a booze company, uh, Hubline, and Hubline was not any smarter about wine than uh, Shenley had been when they were running Roma. Uh, they came in with the idea that uh, you ought to be able to make anything you want out of Thompson Seedless, and they simply didn't understand when I told them, no, you can't do that. <clears throat> it doesn't, it won't work. Um, you have to have good wine grapes. Oh, we got all the grapes in the world. Well, I know, but you don't have good wine grapes in the world. So they, one of the things they tried to do was uh, when, uh, when I went to uh, BV in Napa Valley. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Let me just call it a... No worry. I don't know. How do I... Oh, here. I turned off over here. I like your ringtone. I should have done that before. Sorry. It's quite right. Anyway, um... Uh... Where, where, where was I? Um, so you were describing how Gallo clearly had a vision, um, and they very quickly usurped the domination. Over. Yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, Hubline, uh, after they bought Italian Swiss Colony, they also bought uh, Italian Swiss Colony was a co-op, and uh, run by a growers co-op, and uh, they had bought uh, Ingelduck because Ingelduck was a fine quality winery very fine, uh, BV standards, Bolivia standards, uh, but they were very small and John Daniel was getting older and uh, uh, didn't really want to stay in the business any longer and so he uh, took the best offer he could get and that came from Italian Swiss. And then when Hubline bought Italian Swiss, they owned, they got Ingelnook. Well, the next thing they started doing is searching around trying to buy some better quality wineries and uh, sure enough, they bought um, BV, Beaulieu Vineyard, uh, they bought that in uh, 1969 on my birthday, June 5th. The conclusion of this interview can be found in the next podcast, already available for your download. Thanks again for tuning in to the official podcast of Pal Exposure, featuring Alona Thompson.